you to our first uh, event of the semester for PolySci 395, our director's corner. Uh, I, I know I know all the students, but just to, for those of you who I may not have had a chance to chat with this semester so far, I'm Professor Art Arbach. I run the internship programs at the Unruh Institute as part of the Center for the Political Future. And we're very fortunate to have our co-founders uh, with us today, co-founders or co-directors or both, I guess. Um, Professor Bob Shrum and uh, co-director Mike Murphy, who are going to be here uh, for about the next hour or so. And we're going to have a chance uh, to listen to what their insights are, both in terms of getting involved in politics. How does a, a person coming out of college get into politics? And what does that path sort of look like? Perhaps even uh, for those of you who are interested in running for public office, I think the insight from both of these gentlemen will be um, really unique. And also, um, I think it, we would be remiss if we didn't spend a little bit of time talking about the November election. And we're excited to be able to get their insight in that regard. So before um, I moderate uh, some questions for both uh, Bob and Mike, I do have a few announcements for PolySci 395. Most of these 395 announcements only apply to the traditional internship program, but the last one involves both traditional and research. So I'll make sure that I don't um, confuse people. So with regard to PolySci 395 traditional interns, um, I think most, if not all of you, maybe there's a few stragglers out there haven't signed up for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. Um, you need to do that. Your research proposal is due on September 25th. That's a week from this Friday at 5 p.m. And in order to do that, you need to meet with me. We go over how the um, assignment uh, is put together and discuss possible topics. If you have not signed up or there's not space available at this point, please email me directly and we will find a time to meet with you uh, before that due date. Uh, in terms of both PolySci 395 traditional and the research interns, uh, the first political event write-up is due on October 2nd by 5 p.m. Keep in mind there is a difference between political events and these professionalization workshops. You get credit for attending these professionalization workshops. Uh, we are taking attendance right now and you will get credit for being here. There's no write-up associated with tonight's event, but you also need to go and observe two political events, in which case you'll do your short uh, memorandum write-ups and those need to be uploaded on Blackboard. Again, the first one is due by October 2nd at 5 p.m. So you wanna be mindful of uh, of that deadline. All right, with no further ado, I want to turn to our two panelists and start our conversation. I will say I plan on moderating the panel for about 40 minutes or so, but I do want to leave the last 20 minutes for questions from you all, for either Bob uh, and Mike, or I, you know, both of them. I, again, I think this is really a nice opportunity for you all, students, to get some face time with our co-directors and be able to um, interact and engage with them. So start thinking about questions you might have. I will be mindful of the time so I don't cut our uh, Q&A portion short and you all get a chance to, um, to chat with uh, both Bob and Mike. So let me do some brief introductions. But again, part of what tonight is, is about each of these gentlemen telling us their journey. But just so you know, uh, in general, where they've come from, who they are, what they do, Bob Shrum is, uh, the founder and co-director of the Center for the Political Future. He is the Warshaw Chair for Practical Politics within the Department of Political Science and International Relations. He has worked as a political strategist and speechwriter for a multitude of public figures, including Senators George McGovern, Edward Kennedy, um, was an advisor for the Gore-Lieberman campaign, the Kerry Edwards campaign, and has also worked with um, Joe Biden, Barbara Mikulski, and many, many others. Mike Murphy, our other co-director at the Center for the Political Future, uh, on the other side of the aisle has worked for uh, well over 20 Republican statewide campaigns, gubernatorial races with the likes of Jeb Bush, Mitt Romney, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's worked on six presidential campaigns, most recently with uh, the late John McCain, and has been a frequent and is a frequent commentator on NBC, CNN, and NPR, as well as I'm sure several others. Uh, Mike and Bob keep very busy. It seems like a day doesn't go by that I don't actually read one or both 
of your names in the LA Times or other uh, publications. So this is a question I'm gonna ask to both of you, uh, which I always like to for this particular workshop, which is simply, can you tell the story a little bit, maybe we'll start with Bob and move over to Mike, about your journey to where you left college and were starting to presumably think about politics and how you made your way through your career to where you're at today. So Bob, why don't you go ahead and start and give us a sense? Well, I, you know, it could take a long time to answer that question. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and get, do it briefly. Get the highlights. Uh, I always loved politics. Uh, I remember asking my parents if I could stay home from school to hear Douglas MacArthur's speech to Congress when Truman fired him as the head of US forces in Korea. Uh, I spent a lot of time in high school and college as a debater uh, and, uh, and then went to Harvard Law School. Uh, and after I got out, uh, I certainly knew I didn't want to practice law. Uh, uh, a friend of mine named Larry Tribe, who is uh, one of the great constitutional lawyers in America, said to me, uh, you know, you, you, you need to really get active in politics. You love it. I'd been an intern for Pierre Salinger, JFK's press secretary at the 1960 Democratic Convention when I was 16 years old. Uh, and uh, Larry wrote letters to two people. Uh, one he knew at, uh, at Mayor John Lindsay's office in New York. So I did briefly work for a Republican, and then he stopped being a Republican. Uh, and the other he wrote to someone he knew who later became a very close friend of mine in Ted Kennedy's office. And uh, the person in Teddy's office wrote back and said, we just don't have any room right now. And the Lindsay people invited me to come down and have a discussion with them uh, and told me to go back and write a speech. Uh, so I went back to the hotel and wrote a speech and brought it back. And they said, oh, we thought you were going to send it. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. They said, no, let's see it. Anyway, about an hour later, I was hired. Uh, so I have a very unusual way into politics. I mean, I had worked in the 52, I, I, they wouldn't let me go door to door, I was too young, but the 52 Stevenson campaign at the headquarters in Culver City, which is where I grew up. And then in the 56 Stevenson campaign, and, and uh, the JFK campaign. So I, I got in to politics in a very unusual route. Uh, and, you know, I went, I went from Lindsay to ultimately in, in 1972, being George McGovern's uh, speechwriter. And uh, I, I was very young when I wrote the acceptance speech, which was delivered at three in the morning, uh, which was a disaster. But, uh, that may have been why we lost 49 states. We were a children's crusade. I mean, Gary Hart, the campaign manager, was in his early 30s. Pat Cadell, our pollster, was 21 and hadn't yet graduated from college. I took a uh, class. I took a class with Pat Cadell at UCSB, and I had no idea you were ever connected to him. Well, as with everybody in Pat's life, uh, uh, we ended up not being friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Pat was very close to Joe Biden and got in a big fight with him years ago. And, um, and that was sort of a pattern. Pat died prematurely uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Wow. Uh, so, uh, and I went, you know, from there, I was a Kennedy fellow at Harvard at the, at the IOP. Uh, and then uh, worked for briefly for Jimmy Carter, who I did not think should be president as I got to know him and I left and I became the Washington editor of a magazine called New Times, which won the National Magazine Award and then was closed down because we weren't making enough money by the conglomerate that owned us. Uh, and I went to work for uh, Ted Kennedy in, in just before his 1980 presidential campaign. Uh, was his press secretary and speechwriter afterwards. Uh, and then in 19, end of 1984, decided I wanted to get into political consulting. And Pat Cadell was actually one of, you know, one of the three partners of that initial venture. Uh, and I, you know, I, I 
I've done over, I did over 30 winning Senate campaigns and uh, 10 or 12 winning gubernatorial campaigns, the mayors of most American cities. I uh, worked overseas for the British Labor Party for many years uh, and uh, for uh, Bertie Ahern, who was the Taoiseach or Prime Minister in Ireland, uh, worked in Colombia, uh, where we actually elected the anti-drug candidate after they stole the election from him four years earlier. Uh, and I did, and I worked in Israel uh, in the only campaign uh, that Netanyahu ever lost uh, in 1999. Uh, you know, Kerry, Gore, uh, anyway. Uh, and then I decided after 2004 that, uh, and I had a, an offer from NYU to go teach in the graduate school there, which I did, um, until the provost from USC showed up one day, and I'm from California and always intended to come back here, uh, and said, would you, uh, would you, uh, would you consider becoming the Warshaw professor? Uh, and I said, yeah, but I had to talk to my wife, but yeah. And so a week later, I was, I, I, I was hired and the people in the political science department were nice enough to vote that, uh, yes, it was acceptable for me to have the job. Uh, I love teaching. Uh, I love what we've been able to do at the center and we do it on a kind of shoestring. I got a call in, uh, in 2016 from the dean uh, Amber Miller, who said, I want you to take over the Unruh Institute, but I want you to reimagine it. And we've done a lot of reimagining since then. Uh, and so we run, and some of you have been part of it, we run a lot of, we run a lot of programs that expose people to politics, expose them to the major actors in politics, uh, create internships, uh, which Art does a fabulous job at. Uh, and, uh, you know, we did innovative things. Mike had this great idea, uh, uh, what, a year ago, more, more than a year ago, a year, 18 months ago, to send 10 or 11 students to Iowa to work all summer uh, with a stipend, and uh, we raised the money with a stipend, and they could choose what campaign they wanted to work for. Uh, so... We're doing a lot of interesting stuff, and maybe we'll get into that later. Maybe we'll just talk about the presidential campaign. Sure. Uh, the one thing Mike and I don't have in common is our political affiliation. The one thing we do have in <laughs> common is that we both went to Georgetown. So why don't you, Mike, uh, take over? Well, Bob, thank you very much, and thank all of you for being here. Art, good to see you. Uh, you know, I, I want to just preface this for a minute before I go into my favorite topic, which is me. <laughs> um, and, and just when you think about going into politics, you, you've got to remember there are a lot of different tribes in politics that, you know, some way interact, but there's the policy tribe where you wind up running the bus system for the city of, you know, Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is honorable work because you're a real public servant there and there's some of the same skills you'd have in business. There's the policy world where you may be a think tank and the world's greatest expert on the cost of building a solar grid. There's the candidate politics where you're in a very entrepreneurial world of vote for me and trying to kind of climb that ladder to serve in a legislature or uh, be elected to executive office somewhere, a mayor, senator, a governor, whatever. And there's the kind of political operative world of politics, which is where Bob and I have spent our careers. And that's where you're kind of backstage doing the campaign stuff. So anyway, my story is pretty simple. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. My grandfather was an elected municipal politician there in the old democratic machine. So I grew up around kind of Irish Catholic, democratic, old school politics. And I was always interested in kind of film and theater. I also knew, and I, I, I kind of came of age in the late seventies, uh, wound up in college in 1980. Uh, I was very interested in international relations and foreign policy. So as Bob said, I went off to the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And I remember I was a Russian area studies major and this was during the Cold War near the end of it. So off to fight the Russians. So I would trudge through campus every morning being an idiot, having not thought this through when I signed up uh, for an 8.30 a.m. class four days a week, uh, 
with Major Peter Pirogov, late of the Soviet Air Force, who decided one day that he was tired of, of being on that side, took a swig of antifreeze, fired up the MiG-21 and flew it over to West Germany, landed it through the keys at the first uh, NATO officer he saw and said, I need a job. He was about 6'3", 280, flat top haircut, right, right out of central casting. And I remember every morning getting there and being screamed at in Russian. So I started thinking, okay, this is one path, but I'm particularly interested in politics and, and the policy side of foreign policy and film and theater. So I, uh, with some friends, we took over the College Republicans, which was a thriving thing on campus. We also had thriving College Democrats back then. And we promptly, over the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, all went out and got arrested at the Russian embassy and you know, had all kinds of fun raising hell like college kids do and trying to impress women. And that went on for a while, but I was offered some internships. So I wound up, and again, learning about politics, the internships were on Capitol Hill on the Republican side were kind of a patronage machine of the college Republicans. So, you know, being chairman, I figured I should take the most interesting internship to kind of test it out. Uh, I did, I wound up in the house recording studio. And that's where I first met some congressmen, other than my local congressman, a nice Democrat named Lucian Nedzi, who I'd, I'd met as a kid back home at like Flag Day. Well, I met a congressman uh, one day working in the House recording studio who was convinced that Darth Vader's lightsaber was real. That's when I started thinking there might be some room at the top in politics. <laughs> so um, I started working as an intern making TV commercials, crude, cheap ones, with a guy you might have seen on TV called Alex Castellanos who was my business partner for a long time and a, a close friend of mine, uh, and sleeping on couches, working for campaigns that couldn't afford to pay us anything. Luckily, I had uh, several mentors. One was an eccentric but brilliant strategist and pollster named Arthur Finkelstein, who taught me a lot about political strategy. Uh, I got a call in my dorm room in the middle of college from a, a, a consultant uh, who specialized in kind of congressional races, and there was an incumbent congressman in Long Island who had just won a primary by only 40 votes, which is unheard of in Long Island because it's a Republican machine. He was out in the fishtail, Suffolk County, and he, uh, he was for the Shoreham nuclear power plant, not because of any great insight into energy policy. He, he didn't want to get on the wrong side of all the, all the construction contractors there who were looking forward to building this huge boondoggle nuclear power plant. So even it was a swing district that tilted little Republican and he was losing and nobody would work for him. Well, I, need, I was tired of, of busting tables, uh, so I went right to work from them and made some irresponsible but effective radio ads, uh, basically a War of the Worlds type thing where we, 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 we were testing the Long Island nuclear evacuation system in case of a meltdown at Shoreham, which we pinned on our opponent because he had voted in the state legislature to actually operate Shoreham to pay off a bunch of bonds for 10 years and then shut it down. We beat him. Nobody thought he could win, and he won. And now I'm sitting uh, my senior year in 1984 in my dorm room at Georgetown. I'm getting calls from congressmen about helping on their campaigns. So I, I immediately got Austin Ranney, the great political scientist. I went to see him for advice. And he said, don't be an idiot. Take a leave of absence from Georgetown. Get out of here. You, you're going to get a front row seat in American politics. You had, run, don't walk. So I did exactly that. And I have to admit, I'm still on a leave of absence my senior year from Georgetown. <laughs> um, I may one day go back as the world's oldest senior. But that turned into a career in political communications. I had my own agency, sold it to a big conglomerate, wound up doing a lot of corporate work, the company and, you know, that wants to uh, uh, fix its image, crisis, and a million campaigns. I, I'm kind of proud that I was the senior strategist for John McCain on the old Straight Talk Express helped get Mitt Romney and about 10 other guys elected governors all over the place. Once in a while, would go run campaigns against uh, Shrum over here. We'd go battle it out in some Senate race or governor race somewhere. Worked around the world in various places from Central America to uh, the former Soviet Union uh, and, and had a hell of a good time for years and years and years. Now, I don't do candidate campaigns anymore. I came out here to California to run the Schwarzenegger thing in 2003. And I stayed, met my wife, got married, learned how to pay communist level taxes, you know, basically bought into California. And I live here now. I like it. I work in show business on the side, writing scripts, I have a, kind of having a fun time there. I'd still advise some big companies. 
I'm currently the strategic advisor to Republican voters against Trump. So I'm dabbling a little in that, but I'm out of the candidate business. I'm very happy that Bob, my old friend, political opponent, but friend, a lesson we try to teach at the center, that your opponents are not your enemies. Um, you know, it's not a matter of the equation of I'm right, you're evil. Uh, anyway, Bob lured me out for Mexican dinner and started pouring margaritas down my throat. And before I knew it, I, uh, I'd signed up here to help. And we've been having a lot of fun ever since. So oh, great. Uh, oh, I also host a podcast, if you're a real nerd. Uh, we, we do a podcast at the center, but my old friend David Axelrod and I do one called Hacks on Tap. And soon special guest Bob Shrum will be on talking to him about the presidential debates. So if you're into political podcasting about what's really going on in politics, you ought to check us out. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So um, let me uh, bounce back to Bob for a second. I'm going to ask both of you the same question. And that is, you know, knowing what you know today, having experienced what you experienced throughout your careers, um, would you have done anything differently? You know, the one thing that sort of resonates with me that I hear from both of you is there was certainly some intention on each of your parts, but you certainly had a willingness to pivot from place to place to place which may very well just be what polit the way politics operates. Bob, would you have done anything different in your career path to sort of achieve your goals? Oh, you're muted, Bob. Bob let, me say, let, me, <laughs> let me first say a couple of things. I've been lucky enough in my life, uh, including now, to be paid for and to make a living for doing what I love. And that's a, that's a rare privilege, and, and I'm very conscious of it. Second, yes, there was a, you know, a, lot, a lot of movement. It's the nature of, of political consulting that you would move around. But I had a lot of clients who were clients forever. I mean, Ted Kennedy was my client forever, up, up, up until he died, actually. Uh, and Barbara Mikulski was my client forever. I mean, there were a lot of people like that. Uh, I guess I would do two things differently off the top of my head. First, I would, uh, I would fight even harder than I did uh, to get Gore to recognize that he could not carry Tennessee and to take all the money we were pouring into Tennessee advertising and put it on Boston and uh, Manchester, New Hampshire television because we lost the state in 2000 by 3000 votes. Mm. Uh, Kerry would win it actually in, in 04. If we had won New Hampshire, then Florida would have been irrelevant. Uh, the other thing that I would change, and I tried to change at the time, I just lost the argument, was uh, I would never have taken the federal funding in 2004 for the general election. We, we didn't take it for the primaries. We raised $250 million which was unheard of for a Democrat at that time. We did as well as Bush did in the, in the pre-convention period uh, and gone out of federal funding and relied on the, the internet and, uh, and, and, and our own fundraising. Uh, and then we wouldn't have had to say, gee, you know, our tracking poll shows us only three points behind in Colorado, but we got to get out of there because we don't have enough money. Uh, and, you know, there are too many places that you had to triage. So I, I, I would change those. But for my life, you know, I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm married to someone I love. Uh, I, I, I had an amazing time in politics and I'm having an amazing time now. Uh, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess the only other thing I might have done was back when it was cheap, I would have bought a house in Florence because I love going to Italy. But... <laughs> That's it. That's a pretty short list, Bob. I think you're in pretty good shape. Mike, how about you? Would you have taken a different tact? I mean, it seems to me that, that your tactic into politics was pretty direct and, and you must have had a series of mentors, I assume, along the way that really helped guide you. Would you have done anything differently to get where you wanted to go? Well, yeah, I, that's a great question. I, I don't really have any regrets. Uh, that's the title of my upcoming autobiography. <laughs> it's actually the title of Bob's, uh, or No Excuses. And I'm, I'm kind of in the, the same place. I've, I've, I've had a fun career. I've always been, you know, focused on the idea of not getting bored. 
So when I decided I'm going to move to California and see if I can sell a script, well, now I've sold five. You know, I, I like having new challenges uh, and learning about different things. And the nice thing about a career in communications and politics is you get in a lot of secret places and behind the curtain and a lot of things. Uh, and you can, you can kind of have those experiences, which I've always tried to do. I mean, like Bob, I can look back at campaign mistakes. It, in the political consulting business, when you start out, you're kind of like a young doctor. You're excited to cut. You know, you can hardly wait to operate whether they need it or not, because uh, you just want to get experience. So, you know, early in your career, you have a, you, you, you will take on people later. If you're good at it and you're in demand, you can be really choosy. Uh, I'll tell you one professional regret, uh, and I'll go to New Hampshire uh, to give you a parallel story to Bob. In, in, in 1995, where, where I'm always the most... Um, idealistic is in presidential primaries. I always sign up with whoever I think would be the best president. I mean, remember, I ran both of Jeb Bush's winning governor races, yet I turned on the Bush family two years after doing Jeb's comeback in 98 to work for John McCain. And, you know, almost all my clients, I had a lot of the Republican governors uh, were all for Bush. Um, but I thought McCain would be the best president in 2000. Well, in 95, there was an exceptional governor of Tennessee named Lamar Alexander at 1%. But he really impressed me, even though I had great respect for Bob Dole, who I had worked for on, uh, earlier in my career in 88. But I went to work for Lamar. And he was a, a wonderful person to work for. And he swore me at the beginning of the campaign. He said, you know, you're in charge. But I want, you know, one of the promises I want is I, I want to never have a debt on this campaign. You got to give me your word of honor, no debt. And I want to keep a shutdown account so if we don't make it because we're a long shot, there's money in the bank to pay for all the accounting and auditing because back then we take matching funds and there's all kinds of compliance costs. So sure enough, we are surging in New Hampshire. We're catching up fast on Bob Dole and we're running out of money. And 12 days out of the New Hampshire primary, Lamar wouldn't change his mind on that. And I had to decide whether to break my word to him or not. If I had broke my word, we had about a million dollars, put it on television. I think he would have beat Bob Dole in New Hampshire. He and Buchanan both would have. And I think Lamar Alexander would have been the Republican nominee and would have given Clinton one hell of a fight. But I kept my word, as I've always tried to do in politics. And we lost New Hampshire, and we were out of the race a few weeks later. Uh, so one thing about being a successful campaign consultant, you have to have a personality that's ready to take big responsibility like that and live with the outcome. It's kind of like being a Big Ten football coach. Everybody thinks they can do your job, but there are very few people who actually do it. And, you know, when, when you win, it's the quarterback. When you lose, it's you. And, you know, you just have to, have to decide is keeping your word or doing the most brutal, pragmatic thing. You, you try to do both, but not always. So I kind of have a regret sometimes that I – I didn't work in Lamar's interest and go blow that money, but you know, I'm, I, I, the truth is I don't think I would have changed my decision as painful as it is to think back to. Right, great. Um, I, I wanna be mindful of our time to give students times to ask questions, but I certainly wanna turn our discussion a little bit towards the election. I mean, we're inside what, 50 days or so? Um, 48. You know, 48, 48 days. days. You know, I will tell you, Bob, I actually counted it three times on the calendar. I couldn't believe it was that few. I thought we were at 60 still. Um, so, of course, I think at this point, and I completely understand polls can be overrated. They certainly were uh, in 2016. But, uh, Bob, for you, um, you know, Trump seems to be trailing in a number of the swing states, the important swing states I saw this morning. He's He's down by about six in Wisconsin and, and uh, a couple of the other major important states that, you know, he's down significant numbers. Um, if you were, uh, and I know this is going to put you in a position you're probably not very comfortable with, if you were advising Donald Trump as his strategist, don't worry, I'm going to have Mike represent Biden here in just a second. Um, what, what sort of advice or what do you, what do you imagine uh, the type of advice that Trump's getting for trying to get traction going on these swing states? Because it seems like uh, there's, there's not been a lot of change in the last, I don't know, you know, at least month to two months with, with so much going on in the world. First of all, he runs on instinct and id. So I'm not sure how much 
he takes advice. I mean, I, I'm sh I, I can't believe they're not telling him to stop lowering expectations for Biden before the debate by implying that Biden's not up to it, can't do it. Right. But he can't help himself. Uh, assuming that Donald Trump was not Donald Trump, I think that he missed a massive opening at the beginning of this COVID crisis. Had he called a press conference and, and prepared carefully and said, there is this virus, it may come here, we're gonna do everything we can to stop it, but in the world we live in, that's gonna be very hard. It is a very dangerous virus. Uh, we need to, I'm gonna to go to the Oval Office, we're gonna to go to work on this. You're gonna be briefed every day, but you're gonna be briefed by the medical people. I'll come out sometimes, but you're gonna be briefed by the medical people. And I'm not gonna hold any rallies in the meantime because this is a dangerous virus that can be transmitted and I want people to wear masks. I think you'd be in a whole different place today. There, in addition to the fact that there'd be tens of thousands more people alive, he politically would be in a whole different place. Uh, he has now made a bet that he can fundamentally turn a lot of the election toward the riots, the civil disorder, and even though in our polling, Biden has a very slight advantage on who can handle that, he's gonna keep pushing that and pushing it and pushing it. Uh, I could not be part of that if I were advising him I'd have to leave because it's so race infused, I couldn't, I, I couldn't deal with it. Uh, and he's gonna push very hard to reopen the economy, reopen football games, et cetera, uh, so that he can say the recovery is beginning. Uh, that's what's gonna happen. And uh, you know, I, I couldn't be party to either of those. Uh, now, Mike, I gotta say, is doing a fabulous job for Joe Biden with these ads that they're making called Republican Voters Against Trump, some of which people who are in my class have, have, have seen. Uh, so I just tell Mike to, to keep going. And <laughs> my, Mike did have one great piece of advice, which, uh, which Biden did take, which the, was that he had to go out there and give a, a, uh, a serious speech condemning the violence and the riots and saying those people ought to be prosecuted. And they've spent $45 million on an ad that reinforces that message. Mike, can you talk a little bit about uh, where you think Biden should go? I mean, you know, there, sure. there, you, you hear so much, like, I tell you, if I hear from Chris Christie one more time about how Biden needs to get out of the, what does he say, the bunker or get out of the, um, out of his house or whatever, when, you know, it just, it's, you know, what strategy would you say going forward? And, and if you would, Mike, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, Trump just had this town hall last night that I think <laughs> is supposed to be some profound moment and the Biden campaign's not going to do one. And I wonder what the thought process uh, is on that. Yeah. Well, first, again, I'm a conservative Republican, but this year I'm going to rent, not buy and be a Democrat for a day. I've been anti-Trump since 1993 when I was running politics for Governor Christine Todd Whitman in uh, both of her terms. And Trump was down in Atlantic City, stinking up the place, ripping people off and just basically being awful. So I'm, I'm glad to see uh, others joining the, uh, the, the hate Trump bandwagon that I've been on for 30 years. Um, so one, if the election is held tomorrow, but Joe Biden wins. So, you know, with 48 days left, and remember election day now is about 12 days long. So you, you really, you know, want to peak in about uh, 36 days. Wow. Uh, Biden is in a strong position and every day where nothing happens is a good day for Biden. Uh, Trump's the candidate who needs something to happen. And if I were the Biden people looking at the race, I'd say, I just want to control the agenda. I want to get off riots. And the 45 million in the speech were about pivoting because if we're debating riots till the end of this, so it's a yeah. good campaign for Trump. It's full of opportunity. What Biden's trying to do is exhaust the issue, beat it even, and then get back to his stuff, which is fire Trump for one failure after another, which is what the country's wanted to do for about four years. Trump was in trouble before, excuse me, Trump was in trouble before COVID. And unlike most politicians who were able to use that moment of crisis, and Bob talked about this, to elevate, Trump made it worse by telling people to go drink Clorox. So I would worry about two things if I were Biden. I'd be happy, but I would be paranoid. Um, I would worry first about 
the endless drumbeat of Biden's hiding in his basement. Now, most people are decided, which is good for Biden. And the undecided, I think it's a tiny bit bigger than the polling shows, but it's fairly small. That's also good for Biden because Trump has to win much of the undecided to catch up, at least in the popular vote, little less so in the swing states. So if I were the Biden people, I would want to try to move the agenda. I would knock down this thing. Biden, Trump does appear to be more active than Biden right now. Uh, it's not hard. Biden can go out and walk his dog at a brisk pace. And anything that shows motion and physicality would be very good for Joe Biden. They're starting to campaign more. They, it's, kind of, it's funny, the Republicans under Trump have become the stupid party, but the Democrats are often the neurotic party. So they're so tangled up in winning a star for acting right under COVID, which I applaud, but it's not an excuse for Biden who's got quite an apparatus to be able to move a bit of a bubble around and show a little more action. So I would, I would nail that, that Trump charge by showing just a little more speeding around and you know he can go do things that aren't playing golf. So I think he can knock that thing down, but it's starting to get a little traction and you don't want that. The bigger issue is, and our poll shows this in the poll I just got back of secret poll in Florida where we're spending about $5 million tomorrow as we open a television assault on Trump among Republicans and independents. There is, Trump is behind on everything. Joe's more likable. Joe cares about people like me. Joe's better on healthcare. But the number one issue for people, or the top two, depending on the answer question, is often the economy. And while Trump has a small lead there nationally, we have it at about three or four points, I think, on our poll. Polls I see in Florida are more like eight points. You, you, that's the one filament web that Trump is hanging from. And Biden needs to engage on that, on middle-class economics, on screwing up COVID, also screwed up the economy, and Trump doesn't know what to do. Biden doesn't have to win the economic thing, but he, need, he, he, he shouldn't let Trump run 20 points better on a vital issue to many voters than Trump does on any other issue. So I would spend a lot of time in October hurting Trump as economic manager to take away that edge, because you cut that spider thread and the spider is totally done. Uh, so vigor, economic offensive on kitchen table economics. And, you know, I, I Bob alluded to this too. Um, debates, I think they sometimes are overrated in presidential races, but this one's going to be important because Biden is still fairly undefined. People don't know that much about him. Old Senator, not <laughs> Trump. That's enough right now. But the country is going to get a good look at Biden there. And if he performs well, it won't only knock down all the Trump jazz about, you know, he's senile, he can't find the stage, which isn't true. So it ought to be pretty easy to knock down. Uh, but he'll also become minimally sufficient, okay, to have people comfortable just totally abandoning Trump. So I'd be focused on those three things. Great. Wonderful insight. Uh, one last question for me before I turn it over to the class. So please start thinking of your... Uh... I have your questions, you could just raise your, your virtual hand, if you will, and I can call on you. Um, Bob, any October surprise that you see coming oh, in sure. the near future? I think Trump could announce a vaccine. I think uh, after Ron Johnson, senator from Wisconsin, conducts this or puts out this report on Hunter Biden and Ukraine, uh, which Mitt Romney condemned today, by the way, uh, and he seems to be, he seems to have more courage than all the rest of the Republican senators put together. I wouldn't be stunned if Bill Barr uh, uh, indicted Hunter Biden uh, in the last several weeks of October. I don't think it would work. I think people would, would see it as political. But uh, the one thing about Trump, he, he, if, even if you cut that last thread and the spider falls to the floor, mm. the spider is going to do everything he can to sting and to get back in the game. Mm -hmm. mm. Mike, how about you? Any, any October surprises you envision? Oh yeah, we're gonna have a hundred October surprises. That's yeah. the problem. It's the whole story of the Trump era. There's something crazy every day, which like the lobster in the slowly boiling pot. <laughs> it's the lobster kind of, no. against the spider. I don't know, I got a lot yeah, of no, I'm going visions from going on. To get analogies today. <laughs> I'll work centipede in later. Um, <laughs> but the point is, it, it, look, we've already had five earthquakes in this campaign at least and people are just so shell-shocked they just want it to be over but what could happen well one there's always the chance of a foreign policy crisis there are a lot of warships bumping around the, the the south pacific right now between the japanese the chinese 
um, the Taiwanese and the uh, South Korean. So there's all kinds of recipe for trouble there. Middle East, always a powder keg. Um, so there's the foreign stuff and that can cut a lot of different ways depending on, on what happens. Do people think, oh my God, Trump's not up to it? Or do they think the tough guy president who sank the gunboat is the, you know, the guy we need, Biden's too weak. So that's a whole suite of things. You got the Southern District of New York. Now, I don't believe like the Hunter Biden thing, which I think is a reasonable shot of happening. That stuff is a Washington food fight. Cable TV will love it, but real people will be, it's like this Woodward book. It, historically, it's very important to any thinking person. It's a huge indictment of Donald Trump. But my relatives back in Detroit think Woodward is the big street where they hold the classic car rallies that <laughs> runs north to south in the Detroit suburbs. So that'll light up all the cable TV squabbling and, and all that stuff. But if the Southern District of New York starts like they've leaked, uh, looking at criminal tax evasion charges against Trump, that's something people get cheating on your taxes. So that could make for a turbulent uh, October. Biden could have a bad gaffe. B Biden does that. And, but it could be a bad and interesting one. Eh, maybe that's something. Um, Trump, we'll find out there's another Bob Woodward tape where Trump tells the joke about the rabbi, the priest, and Martin Luther King. You know, some horrible racist thing. He's capable of that. That blows everything up. So yeah, I think we're gonna, it's not gonna be an October surprise. It's gonna be a surprise of the week through October. And uh, you know, we're, all, we're also, the other thing to watch in this election that's a little different is we have st systemic problems. Because of COVID, states that normally don't do a lot of absentee ballot voting are going to do more. And there are problems teaching state bureaucracies a new trick in short time. Now, luckily, of the swing states that count, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, Arizona, and arguably North Carolina, none of them are complete swing, uh, complete absentee ballot disaster states. The best news is Florida is a very good absentee state. They count their stuff in real time. So by noon after the election, you're gonna know 95, 96% of the Florida vote. And, and no Republican has won the presidency without Florida, where Biden is currently up about three points in 100 years. So the Florida thing could really be important. But Pennsylvania, of those swing states, is in the worst shape because they're not used to a lot of absentee. The system is under strain. The US Post Office was in trouble long before the president appointed a political idiot in charge of it. So there's trouble there. And the, the way they wrote their new law has legal vulnerabilities. So Pennsylvania is the state where Biden's looking okay, but stuff can go wrong on the count. That means a delayed week before we know what's going on. Lawsuits and pounding ballots, Trump saying it's all a scam to steal the election, Bill Barr, you know, the, there's a lot of banana republic stuff that's lurking around this year, which kind of concerns me, though I take some solace in Michigan um, and Florida and Arizona uh, all have pretty tight and effective absentee ballot programs. I worry about Pennsylvania and to some extent Wisconsin. So that's, that is out there too. And that may not be an October surprise, but it could be a November nightmare surprise. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's going to keep us all at night thinking yeah, about Other than this. that, everything's great. Everything, yeah. Other than that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? So um, uh, how about questions from you all? We've got time for probably uh, three or four. Um, people are putting up their hands really quickly. Stuart Carson uh, is one of our research students, and he's um, participating in that program. So Stuart, why don't you go ahead and have the first question, and Trent, uh, one of our traditional interns, uh, can have the second question. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank both of you for uh, being here and talking with us. Um, my question kind of related more to professional development. Um, and more specifically, you know, there's a narrative now that the more uh, radical factions of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are ascendant right now. And I was curious if you guys thought that if working for either of those factions now might be a professional black mark or strike against your career prospects in the future. So like if, if someone interned or worked for um, AOC or any member of the squad or maybe Bernie Sanders um, and, you know, on the other side of the aisle, maybe some Trumpian uh, Republican uh, congressman or woman, do you think that might be a, a strike against our prospective careers? And I'm also just curious, I'm curious about what you think the future of both of those factions are? Well, first, my, my firm worked for Bernie Sanders in 
his Vermont races. And my uh, uh, ex-partner, Tad Devine, uh, actually did his campaign in 2016. Uh, and Tad is now making the DNC ads uh, that are promoting Biden. So I don't think there's any sort of a black mark. I think you have to be a little careful about, uh, and I'll let Mike speak about the Republicans. Uh, we had all of this talk going into the presidential primaries that the Democrats were gonna move way left, they were gonna pick a candidate way on the left, uh, they were, had to be someone new, et cetera. And as our polling revealed actually a year in advance, that was not what was gonna happen. Uh, and I think if Biden wins and he can navigate these uh, fissures in the party, that uh, the Democratic Party will remain a center left party. I don't think it will become a, a pure left wing party. You know, people talk about some primaries, but then you gotta look at other primaries. Delaware the other night, Chris Coons, the incumbent senator faced a big challenge from the left. He won. He, he won overwhelmingly, 75% of the vote. Uh, but if I, if you get an internship with AOC, take it. It'd be very interesting. I think she's a very talented person. I don't happen to agree with her on everything. I think she's a very talented person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, there are some people I probably wouldn't want to work for. Uh, but that would be just a personal choice as much uh, more than a, a professional choice. Mike, yeah, any it, thoughts about this? Yeah, a, a ton. And this one, I think I disagree with Bob a little bit. So the first thing I tell you, and you remember, you got to remember which silo you start out in. Are you in the policy silo? Because if you're an economic expert for the center Democrats or center Republicans versus the conservatives, yeah, you kind of join a tribe and that's where your network is going to be. Uh, so your competition uh, will have another network. And if you're trying to jump from one side to the other, you may be less wired to get the job and all that. But fundamentally, start where, you, you know, it, it's not about you and your career. It's about the cause you join. So if you believe, if you're a squad member and you believe that the squad's messaging is what you believe would be best for the country, I personally would encourage you to take another look at the other points of view to make sure you're making a smart decision on the merits. But if that's where your heart is, go work there. Because political careers are tough and there are ups and downs and you get a lot of war buddies that are part of your career later. So you wanna work with people who are there for a cause they believe in. All us never Trumpers now who have blown up our, I had a 30 year career in the Republican party as a four star general. And I have blown that to smithereens over this. But a lot of the people I see with me were also people who came up with me in the old uh, real politic yet conservative foreign policy circles of the Republican Party, the kind of opportunity conservatives, the, the, the pragmatic governing conservative governors of the Republican Party, the Tommy Thompsons, the John Anglers, the Jeb Bushes, all my clients. So, you know, you kind of stay with your war buddies all the way through, meaning new ones along the way. So join the side you believe in, but think that through. You know, make sure that the flashiest side seduces you as the one you believe in, but you really haven't taken a fair look at the other. I mean, think that through, because you're, you're making a decision between Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and they're all very different. And then, you know, work where you believe, and hopefully the career thing, if you're good at it, will work itself out. But if you want to be rich, if you want to be famous, if you want to be a lot of that sort of stuff, don't go into politics unless you want to be a candidate and understand that for every 300 people who try and everybody should try, very few get to the big fame and sparkle top. Uh, you're in it for the cause. And if you're good at the cause and you serve your country well, either an elected official or, or in, in staff and government service or as a campaign consultant working for people you believe, um, it, it's a great career. Great, uh, Trent Collins. Hi, so this one's for Professor Shrum. You said you left the Carter campaign because you thought he shouldn't be president. Could you, that's interesting. Could you tell me about that? Yeah, I, I, I worked for him for uh, 10 or 11 days, depend on how, depending on how you count it. I had helped him in the months before that. Uh, I had actually written a couple of speeches for him. Uh, I, I did not think that, what, while he's obviously a person of, deep religious faith, I did not believe and did not see in him 
any coherent view of it. I'll take Mike's word. What cause was he in it for? Mm -hmm. I thought the only cause he was really in it for was himself. Uh, he's been an excellent ex-president. Uh, he reminds me of a line from Tacitus, the Roman historian, uh, who wrote of an emperor that all would have thought him fit to rule if he never had. Uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I did make the, I did make the movie. Carter was sort of became an exile in the Democratic Party for a long time, and in 2000, we actually invited him to the convention, and I made the movie about him. Uh, and uh, he he was gracious enough. He came up and thanked me. Uh, but I, I did not think he should be president. And 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 I, I actually assumed at that point that maybe I had blown up my career in Democratic Party politics, but it didn't turn out to be the case. And then let me just tag that with one other point, because mm -hmm. it's just so important and a lesson I think we both learned, though Bob will speak for himself, that there are people in politics who believe in very little other than their own advancement, and a lot of them do really well. But if you wind up staffing somebody like that, they will cash you in for a dime. They're not in the loyalty business, and loyalty is the glue of successful politics. So be careful, because the ones who are the most cynical, who do well for a while, you will find will have no loyalty to you, because you are extremely dispensable to people like that. Yeah, Ted Kennedy was not only my client for, you know, 30 years, but he became a very close friend. And when he was in trouble running against Mitt Romney in 1994, all these people who had worked for him over the years dropped whatever they were doing across the country and came to Massachusetts to work in that campaign. Uh, and that was because he had always been loyal to them. Great. Uh, Alan, you had your hand up. Yeah, this question is also for Professor Strum. Um, I'm just wondering how much do you feel law school benefited, going to law school benefited your political career? Alan, you really want the honest answer? <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> the credential has, has been useful, I suppose. Uh, I think uh, Paul Sarbanes hired me in part, I suspect, because he thought that uh, the cause I cared about or causes I cared about were the causes he cared about, but it didn't hurt that I'd gone to Harvard Law School. Uh, but the truth is I got to law school and it was very different then. So I, I want to be very careful here. Uh, and I discovered that I was learning medieval English land law. I was learning medieval English procedure. Uh, I found it incredibly boring. Uh, to pay my way through law school, they didn't know it. I, I was uh, coaching debate at Brandeis. Uh, so I just coached debate at Brandeis. And what I did in law school aside, I did win the Ames Prize uh, for the Ames Moot Court Prize. But uh, aside from that, uh, I, I almost never went to class uh, and I just took the exams. So I think it was it's useful as a credential and I made many close friends, some of whom are still close friends, uh, but I don't think you, you have to go to law school to go into politics. It's kind of a, an assumption people make. Uh, the one advantage I suppose it has is that if politics doesn't work out, you've got a career you can fall back on. Uh, Bob Casey, who was the governor of Pennsylvania, and his son is now the senator from Pennsylvania, or one of them, uh, uh, when he got elected in 86 and I had done his campaign, he called me up and said, you know, you, uh, you ought to take the Pennsylvania bar. And I said, why? And he said, because it's a ridiculously easy bar. All they do is if, if you pass the essay test, they don't even look at the multiple choice test. He said, you'll pass the essay test. Uh, he said, and then you'll, you'll have a law license. I said, oh my God, if I did that, I might use it someday. Uh, so... I, I didn't really have any interest in, 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 in the legal profession, but it's different now. Law school is much more relevant now than the way it was taught in, in this very traditional form at Harvard in, in the 1960s. Yeah, for what it's worth as a recovering attorney, um, if you're gonna go to law school, practice law for a while. I, I think you owe it to yourself. Um, it doesn't mean you have to do it forever. I'm certainly not practicing now, but I did for 10 years of my life. Um, I just think it's too expensive to go now and not at least engage in 
in the practice of law. It's over $200,000 or at least 150 to go to law school. When I went there in the 80s, it was $36,000 for three years. And when I went, it was, uh, the tuition was $1,500 a semester and you could live on $1,500, $2,000. Right. Uh, so it, 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 I, I, your generation faces these incredible obstacles in terms of cost. Yeah, I, I just add that in my political career, I, what I don't hear is, well, wait a minute, ask him or her their political judgment because they've got a law degree. The, a lot of the people who are most successful in politics are hustling kids from state colleges. You know, I, I get kids, uh, you know, reaching out to me for advice. I'm on the board of the IOP in Chicago, too. And they, they kind of like, I've done this, I've done that. And I said, yeah, but there's a kid from Montana State right now who's up at 5 a.m. pounding yard signs on the route the governor takes to work so we get seen. That kind of hustle really pays off in politics. Yeah. Credentials are great, but, but politics is a hustle business. Yeah, and a people business, that's for sure. All right, last question for Max Ellis, and then we'll call it a night. Max, let it, let it rip. Um, I suppose this, is, this could be a flawed question, and it's pretty general, <laughs> but do you have any advice? Give it to Bob. Aspire <laughs> to, do you have a, advice for students who one day aspire to hold office? What's great. the one thing each of you would offer the silver bullet for someone who wants to run for office one day. Bob, you want to go first and I'll give you mine. Yeah, I don't have a silver bullet. You got to figure out where you want to run. You got to go there. You got to embed yourself in the community, although there is one other route. Uh, and you have to recognize, as Mike said earlier, for every 300 people who do this, you know, one person actually succeeds at it, but you could be that person. Yeah. Uh, the, the other way to do it is there, there is, especially in the House of Representatives, there is some tradition of going to work as a staff person for a, a member of Congress, becoming kind of the top staffer in that office. The member retires, you run for the seat. And sometimes, a fair amount of the time, uh, you'll get the nomination. Uh, but the other thing I tell you is don't go into politics in any form, either to, to run or uh, to advise unless you recognize that every two or four years your heart can get broken and that you can deal with that and you can move on from it. Yeah, I have a fail-proof five-point plan. Point one, inherit $10 million. Uh, then all you can do is run the rest of your life. I'm just being facetious. <laughs> Here's the real five-point plan, and you should do it because uh, as Bob Dole used to say, after he came back from World War II, or he won a couple of bronze and silver stars in his little town of Russell, Kansas, he eventually got elected to Congress. He couldn't believe it. And he was walking around, he tells the story, he was walking around the house and he saw all the statues and the oil paintings and he thought, oh my God, look at this place. How did a you know hayseed from Kansas like me ever get here? Two weeks later, after meeting everybody else who was elected to Congress, he thought, how did these idiots get here? So there is room. Here's my five point plan. One, if you're shy, get over it. Be very good at making and keeping friends. Be, learn to speak on your feet. Go somewhere where you can observe really good hustling politicians at work. Everybody thinks you gotta go to Washington. I actually tell kids who wanna learn about how politics really works not to go to Washington. There's a lot of hierarchy there and you learn a lot of long, wrong lessons. Go home and get a job in your state capital watching state legislators hustle, wheel, and deal. They have smaller staffs. You get to know the actual politicians, but it's all the same skill set. And, you know, find what you're passionate about in politics, what issue set, what, what area, and become really good at it. Become smart. Become the guy. Even at 21, they say, well, what does he think? He, all he does is obsess on the state water plan. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, in the state of Indiana, you're like whatever part, there's a Democrat water guy and a Republican water woman, you know, become that person, have a niche. But state capitals are a great place to learn politics. Great, wonderful words of advice, wonderful panel. I wanna thank both Bob and Mike. I think um, students are so fortunate to have both of you on this campus. The program at the Center for the Political Future is just run so, so well. You've created so many opportunities from students and it's all because of the time and energy that both of you put into this program. So on behalf of our 
joint student classes of uh, poli sci 395 tradition and uh, research. We want to thank you. We want to thank all the students for being here. And with that, we will go ahead and call tonight. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Guys. Good luck. And thank you. Thank all of you.